We are often advised to lower the weight under control when performing resistance training. However, is this really beneficial for muscle growth? And if so, how slow should we control the lowering phase? In this video, we will try to answer these questions. First, we need to understand the basics of muscle contraction. Essentially, there are three different muscle actions that we can perform. Concentric actions are when we produce force while the muscle is shortening. This can be thought of as the portion of the exercise when we lift the load. Next, we have isometric muscle actions. This is when we produce force, but the muscle doesn't change length. This can be thought of as holding or pausing a lift midway through the movement. And most relevant for this video are eccentric muscle actions. This is when we produce force while the muscle is lengthening. This can be thought of as lowering the weight under some control, as opposed to letting the weight drop under the forces of gravity. Another important concept to understand regarding muscle actions is the load-velocity relationship. This describes the relationship between load and movement speed during resistance training. On this half of the graph, we have concentric muscle actions. This relationship suggests that the more load we lift, the slower we are able to lift, and the lighter the load, the faster we can lift the weight. This is pretty obvious in practice. However, as we near our 1RM load for a given lift, we can no longer lift the weight at all. In other words, velocity is zero. However, if we look at the other side of the graph, this shows the eccentric muscle actions. We can see here eccentric muscle actions allow heavier loads to be used compared with concentric actions. So even if we cannot lift the load, we can probably still lower it under some control. What this means in practical terms is that we are always stronger in the lowering phase compared with the lifting phase. So even if we reach complete failure, we are still able to lower the weight under control. This is why we have the ability to manipulate our eccentric tempo more so than our concentric tempo. So getting back to the question of this video, how slow should we control our eccentric tempo? Well, these recommendations may change depending on what we are training for. If we are training for maximal strength, then we want to use the tempo which allows us to lift the most amount of weight possible, at least for our primary strength lifts. This is because the goal is to lift the most amount of weight possible, not necessarily to stimulate muscle growth. For strength, this usually means controlling the load to some extent, but not so slow that it fatigues the muscle for the lifting phase. Furthermore, we want to take advantage of the stretch shortening cycle for strength training, as this will usually allow us to lift slightly more load. We see this with weightlifters, for example, when they bounce out of the bottom of squats to take advantage of the stretch shortening cycle. If they were to control the load too slowly, especially in the very bottom range, then they would probably need to drop the load significantly. But clearly, their priority is strength, not muscle growth, so they train with whatever technique allows them to lift the most weight. Furthermore, when training for speed and power for athletic performance, there is even less concern about controlling the lowering phase. When performing sprints, plyometrics, and loaded power training, the focus is on pure power output, not on muscle stimulation. With these forms of training, the eccentric tempo is usually rapid to take maximal advantage of the stretch shortening cycle. This allows athletes to use the elastic properties of the muscles and tendons to maximize speed and power output. However, when it comes to hypertrophy training, these recommendations become a little more nuanced. For muscle growth, we probably want to intentionally control the eccentric tempo to some extent. Throughout the rest of this video, we will focus specifically on eccentric tempo for muscle growth. The best evidence we have on this topic is this research review, which compiled the entire body of evidence on how tempo influences muscle growth. Overall, it was found that as long as we are training close to failure, the exact tempo implemented doesn't seem to have a major influence on muscle growth. However, the research generally finds a slight trend in favor of performing slightly slower eccentrics paired with faster concentrics. While this review provides a good general overview, let's dive a little deeper into the specifics about how eccentric tempo influences hypertrophy. First, let's look at the effects of fast versus slow eccentric tempos on muscle growth. This study compared the effects of training with a fast versus slow eccentric tempo using the same concentric tempo. Trainees performed preacher curls for three sets of eight reps with the maximum load possible two times per week for 12 weeks. One group trained with a one second eccentric, while the other group trained with a four second eccentric. And both groups performed a one second concentric. 
It was found that both groups saw growth of the biceps, but the slow eccentrics resulted in superior growth shown in the orange, compared with the faster eccentrics shown in the blue. So this study suggests that a slower eccentric tempo tends to be superior to a fast eccentric tempo for muscle growth. So it seems that slower eccentrics tend to be superior to faster eccentrics, but how do moderate eccentrics compare with slow eccentrics? Well, this idea was explored in this study, which compared 2 versus 4 second eccentric training. Trainees performed 5 sets of single leg leg extensions with 70% 1RM 2 times per week for 8 weeks, taking each set to failure. One leg was trained with a 2 second eccentric, while the other leg was trained with a 4 second eccentric, with both legs using a 1 second concentric. It was found that each individual quad muscle saw muscle growth in both legs, with no clear trend in favour of either tempo. However, if we look at the average overall muscle growth of the quads, we do see a slight benefit from training with slower eccentrics. So it seems that moderate eccentrics appear to be similarly effective compared with slow eccentrics, but there still may be a slight benefit to performing slower eccentrics. So far it seems that slower eccentrics have a greater benefit for muscle growth. However, how far can this be taken? How do very slow eccentrics compare with slow eccentrics? Well, unfortunately I couldn't find any solid evidence looking at very slow eccentric tempos on muscle growth. However, what we do know is that the more we slow down our eccentric tempo, the less load or reps we can perform. So, if we slow our eccentrics too much, it may cause too much of a drop in lifting performance. And this may, in theory, have a detrimental effect on long-term muscle growth. Furthermore, super slow eccentrics may increase cardiorespiratory demands during some exercises. This may result in the cardiorespiratory system limiting lifting performance before the target muscle. As a result, hypertrophy may be inferior compared with performing a more moderate eccentric tempo. For example, if we perform squats with an 8 second eccentric tempo, we may end the set due to cardiorespiratory fatigue before the legs are taken close to failure. So, based on all this information, I would theorize that eccentric tempo follows this general relationship with muscle growth. On this end of the spectrum, it is pretty clear that fast eccentrics seem to be slightly inferior for muscle growth. Moderate to slow eccentrics seem to be the sweet spot where we achieve the best muscle growth. And it isn't yet clear whether super slow eccentrics are inferior, but this tends to make sense based on indirect observations. So, as a practical recommendation, lifting with around a 2 to 5 second eccentric is probably where we achieve the most muscle growth. Going faster or slower than this may slightly compromise hypertrophy gains. Furthermore, the exact tempo we implement will also differ based on exercise selection. There are three primary factors pertaining to exercise selection that may influence eccentric tempo. The first is range of motion, or more specifically, the distance we must move the load to complete a rep. Exercises with a larger distance to move will naturally require a longer eccentric duration, whereas exercises with a smaller distance to move will naturally require a shorter eccentric duration. This is because even if repetition speed is the same, it takes longer to travel a further distance compared with a shorter distance. For example, a full depth back squat will involve a larger range of motion compared with something like a preacher curl. Even with the same rep speed, the eccentric portion of the back squat may take around 3 seconds, while it may only take around 2 seconds for the preacher curl. Another factor influencing tempo is something we alluded to earlier, and that is cardiorespiratory fatigue. This refers to fatigue of the heart and lungs delivering oxygen to the working muscles while lifting. To maximize muscle growth, we want the target muscle to be the limiting component of each set, not the cardiorespiratory system. However, if we go too slow on the eccentrics with some lifts, we may need to end the set due to fatigue of this system. This means the muscles may not be as stressed as they otherwise could have been if they were the limiting factor of the set. This is only really a concern for free weight compound lifts which involve many accessory and stabilizer muscles. And it isn't really a concern for machine-based isolation lifts which involve minimal accessory and stabilizer muscles. For example, if we were to control the eccentrics very slow during stiff leg deadlifts, we may be limited by cardiorespiratory fatigue or even lower back muscular fatigue before the hamstrings muscles. On the other hand, a leg curl will almost always be limited by the hamstrings regardless of how slow we control the eccentric tempo. 
And the last factor relevant to this discussion is the stretch shortening cycle. This refers to the elastic recoil we get from performing a fast transition from the eccentric to concentric phase. This primarily occurs in the bottom of any squatting or pressing movements when we go from the lowering to lifting phase. While this usually allows us to perform more reps or load, it probably isn't ideal for maximizing muscle growth. This is because the stretch shortening cycle involves less active muscle contraction and relies more on the elastic tendons to produce force. And this is especially not ideal since it occurs in the portion of the exercise where the muscle is most lengthened. In the bottom of a squat, the quads and glutes are in their most stretched position, and in the bottom of a bench press, the chest is in its most stretched position. And this lengthened muscle position seems to be the most hypertrophic portion of the movement. This was seen in this study which compared partial range of motion training at different muscle lengths. Trainees performed three sets of 10 preacher curls with progressively increasing loads two times per week for five weeks. One group performed only the initial range of the curl, where the biceps are shortened, while the other group performed only the end range of the curl, where the biceps are lengthened. It was found that the lengthened partials resulted in superior growth of the biceps, shown in the orange, compared with the shortened partials, shown in the blue. This suggests that the portion of the movement when the muscle is most lengthened appears to be the most hypertrophic portion of the movement. In relation to eccentric tempo, we probably want to minimize involvement of the stretch shortening cycle. This will ensure the muscle is actively controlling the load in the stretched position, likely resulting in superior growth. This can be achieved by intentionally controlling the eccentric phase all the way to the bottom of the lift without dropping or bouncing at the end range. The variable of tempo also brings up another common idea in the lifting world, and this is time under tension. This refers to the total amount of time a muscle is actively contracting during each set. Trainees often try to increase time under tension as it has been thought of as an important consideration for muscle growth. And by extending our eccentric duration, this would increase time under tension per set. While lowering the weight slower will increase time under tension per set, time under tension isn't really the best method of assessing the hypertrophic stimulus. While it is probably true that more time under tension is probably better than very little time under tension, this is probably more so a byproduct of rep ranges rather than tempo. As we know, training with low rep ranges, less than around 5 reps per set, seems to promote inferior muscle growth compared with moderate rep ranges, around 5 to 20 reps per set. So naturally, performing more reps per set is going to increase our time under tension. Furthermore, the hypertrophic stimulus doesn't really seem to be influenced by time under tension when training within the hypertrophy rep ranges with an appropriate tempo. Going back to the previous study comparing 2 versus 4 second eccentric tempos during leg extensions, we saw that there was not a major difference in muscle growth between legs. This was the case despite total time under tension throughout the study being almost twice as long when training with 4 second eccentrics compared with 2 second eccentrics. If time under tension was really a strong predictor of muscle growth, we should have seen roughly twice the muscle growth in the 4 second eccentric group. So really, there doesn't seem to be a very strong correlation between time under tension and muscle growth. Rather, time under tension is probably just a byproduct of rep ranges and tempo. So we don't necessarily need to chase more time under tension, just make sure you are training with appropriate rep ranges and tempo. Another concept which is influenced by tempo is volume load. This refers to the total amount of load lifted during a workout, usually calculated as sets times reps times load. Unlike time under tension, volume load has a negative relationship with tempo, meaning that the slower our tempo, the less reps or load we can lift, and the lower our total volume load. However, once again, this doesn't have a direct correlation with muscle growth. As we have explored, slow to moderate eccentrics tend to be better for muscle growth compared with fast eccentrics. However, fast eccentrics tend to allow the highest volume loads by increasing the number of reps or load that can be used. However, like we have established, this doesn't necessarily mean that muscle growth will be superior. Based on all this information, let's now establish some practical recommendations. First, we should understand that tempo recommendations may be different depending on what forms of training we are referring to. Strength or power training have different recommendations compared with hypertrophy training. 
In terms of hypertrophy training, we want to somewhat control the eccentric tempo to maximize muscle growth. The exact tempo probably isn't all that important, but somewhere around two to five seconds is probably going to result in similar muscle growth on a per set basis. Shorter eccentrics seem to be less effective, possibly because the weight is lowered more by the forces of gravity rather than active muscle contraction. And very slow eccentrics may reduce performance too much or fatigue other systems, also possibly inhibiting muscle growth. Although we need more research on super slow eccentrics before completely dismissing this idea. Furthermore, the exact tempo we implement will also be influenced by exercise selection. Exercises with a larger range of motion will take longer to complete each rep, while exercises with a shorter range of motion will take less time to perform each rep. We also want to be cautious of slowing down tempo too much for free weight compound lifts, as this may promote excessive cardiorespiratory fatigue, inhibiting the stimulus we provide for the target muscle. And for squatting and pressing variations, we want to be especially cautious of controlling the eccentric in the very bottom position to minimize involvement of the stretch shortening cycle. And lastly, it should be noted that our eccentric tempo can have an influence on other variables such as time under tension and volume load. However, these variables aren't strongly predictive of muscle growth when training close to failure in the appropriate rep ranges with a somewhat controlled eccentric tempo. Thanks for watching and hopefully you got something out of this video. Check out flowhighperformance.com for online coaching, training templates, ebooks and more.